I'm Mark Halpern. And I'm John Heilman. And with all due respect to John Stewart, you've been making secret trips to meet with Barack Obama at the White House? Go, Go on. on. Happy National Donald Trump Day, sports fans. On the Trump Show tonight, Trump, Trump, and Trump. But first, Morgan Freeman. He and Jack Black, Queen Noor of Jordan, Valerie Plame, and others have made a video telling normals to call Congress and support the Iran deal. Like America's actual relationship with Iran, the video is a little long, not wildly funny, and slightly awkward. I love playing Frisbee with my sons. I love to see my grandkids smile. But if Congress sabotages the nuclear deal with Iran? We could be denied the very moments that make our lives worth living. Why? Dude, because we'd be dead. Super dead. Like totally fried by a major nuclear bomb dead. I won't be able to play Frisbee with my sons because there won't even be a Frisbee. The Frisbee will be melted. Holy sh**. Is that? Yes, Jack, it's me, Queen Noor from Jordan. The agreement currently on the table is the best way to ensure Iran doesn't build a f bomb. Meanwhile, in a new CNN ORC poll, 52% of Americans disagreed with the folks in that ad and said that Congress should reject the deal. And today, Secretary of State John Kerry told the House Foreign Affairs Committee, in a languorous four hours of questioning, that the idea of reaching a better deal is a, quote, unicorn fantasy. So, Mark, I ask you, who is at this moment winning the political battle over the passage approval of the Iran deal? The CNN poll notwithstanding, because it depends on how you ask the question, yeah. the president's side is winning. They got Michigan Congressman Sandy Levin today, who is a very pro, hawkish, pro-Israel person. He came out. It, it is clear to most people who are reading the tea leaves with Chuck Schumer that he's eventually going to come out for the ad wars are underway, but in the end, right now, the people who want to stop the deal don't have the votes. And I don't think if the vote were held today, they'd get the votes. It is going to be furious, and it's going to be ugly, and there's going to be a lot of money spent. I think in the end, we're going to basically end up with a partisan division. We're going to have Democrats who are going to be on the president's side, Republicans are going to be on the opposite side. There will not be enough uh, Republican, not, not enough Democratic defections to in any way derail this deal. I just think that is how it's going to come down. Democrats are going to play act for a while and reserve judgment. But in the end, I bet almost every Democrat will be with President Obama. And Jonathan Pollard and the potential release of Jonathan Pollard helps the president. It's a, it's a, it's a clever card to play, right. but he doesn't need it because, as you said, they're likely to hold the Democrats. Chuck, you know, the argument that's, that's carrying a weight with a lot of Democrats is, one of the strongest arguments the president makes, which is the sanctions will not hold. Right. And, and, what's, a, and what's a better alternative? And nothing else is on the table. All right. Jeb Bush, Bush is campaigning like a general election candidate. Lately, he's been talking a lot about the need to, quote, reweave the web of civility in politics and trying to rise above the Donald Trump fray. Bush has also been trying to connect with Hispanic voters. In an interview with Telemundo that caught a lot of people's attention, Jeb did his best to relate to Hispanic voters, in part by speaking Spanish. Yo recuerdo una vez que mi hijo fue a Ocala para jugar eh, un equipo de eh, un juego de béisbol y eran de, de Miami el equipo y la mayoría eran hispanos. Mi hijo George pues tiene un piel es moreno, ¿no? Y hablaron barbaridades de de los de Miami y a un lado, por supuesto, tenía que ex, eh, describir o, o explicar de que gente que odian, pues, no son la mayoría. Hay que aceptarlo, pero ir adelante. Centrist civil rhetoric trying to rise above Trump speaking Spanish. Is this the way to win for Jeb Bush? It's the way to win for Jeb Bush. Uh, it may not be the way to win for other candidates, but he, I look, the guy, you got to give the guy a lot of credit. He said... I'm going to campaign willing to lose this nomination fight in order to win the general election. Those are issues, uh, ways of presenting issues, and the authenticity, talking about his son in that way, those are the, the way a nominee speaks, um, whether it'll play for him or not. But that's the card. That's the hand he's dealt. He's playing it. And he's got $100 million in the bank. A lot more coming. The reports that the Super PAC held back asking people for big checks are true. You're going to see a lot more money in his Super PAC. He is the, the one who's still coming off as the most presidential. And Republicans, since Reagan, have nominated the most electable, conservative, establishment candidate. And that remains, right now, 
John Ellis Bush. I also think that is like a much more effective. I mean, I like Lindsey Graham calling Donald Trump a jackass. That's you know, plain spoken. That's nice. But the actual attacks yeah. on, on Donald Trump are not the best way to refute Trump and Trumpism. The best way to refute Trump and Trumpism is through that kind of a message implicitly. Adults win. OK. Soon we will talk about how much uh, the aforementioned Donald Trump is really worth. But before we get there, Trump is about to do something no other presidential candidate would ever do or could ever do, especially with the first debate right around the corner. Tomorrow, he is going to fly on his own private plane to a golf course that he owns in Scotland, a.k.a. Trump Turnbury, to spend four days taking in the Women's British Open. True. Trump recently said that he spends half his time running for president and half his time on business. This is apparently the business half. So, Mark, will it be out of sight and out of mind for the Donald, or will that man be able to continue to dominate the presidential debate, even from Caledonia? Can you pick up a foreign policy credential if you're basically going to watch a golf tournament? He is on foreign soil, <laughs> looking presidential. I think one call to the Today Show, or to with all due respect, and he can dominate the news cycle anytime he wants. As long as he is first in the polls, it doesn't matter where he is on the planet. It doesn't matter how much time he's devoting to his business dealings. And the thing amongst the many things that people underestimate is he gets that. Well, and you go back to the premise of the question, which is just fascinating, right? It's the moment when the national polls are going to be conducted that Fox is going to use to decide who gets on the bait stage. I know he's confident because he's in the lead. He's not going to not be on the debate stage. But no other candidate would think of absenting himself from America at the moment when whether you're on the mind of Americans is going to determine your place in the presidential debate. Trump is so confident of his place on that stage, of his place in this discussion, that he doesn't care. It's unusual for the candidate with the most money to also be the candidate who can get most easily get earned media. Yeah. Doesn't happen a lot. You could argue it happened with Obama, but it's unusual. The Scots don't like him very much, though. So powerful. Art. So President say. Obama has been in Africa since Friday. In that time, he met the skeleton known as Lucy in Ethiopia. He hung out with a farmer at a factory, took a picture with his traveling press corps, funny, and danced a little bit in Kenya. Oh, and he said this just before jetting home. I love my work. But under our Constitution, I cannot run again. I can't run again. I actually think I'm a pretty good president. I think if I ran, I could win. But I can't. By all the standards we judge presidential trips, how did this one go? I think it was okay. A little bit of a, a little bit to me, a little bit unsatisfying. I think partly because he, he, you know, this should have been a historic trip for him. Going back to Kenya, first time as president to go back to the place of his forebears. Um, didn't get the kind of attention. He did a few things, you know, uh, talking about gay rights in Africa. He did a few things, but uh, we can talk a little more about this. The failures of policy on Africa in this administration have been pretty glaring, and I didn't think he did anything to really counteract that in totally, this trip. Totally disagree. He is making a late push on policy in Africa, but the coverage in Africa that I sampled was extremely good. Yeah, I'm sure. And and he did something hard to do. This trip was never getting a lot of attention in the United States. He made news on things he cared about, including pushing back the Republicans on Iran from Africa. The White House scheduled him very smartly in terms of when he talked publicly. I think it was a very well put together trip and very well executed for the two audiences you always got to do in country, in the region, and back here at home. I don't, I don't dispute the fact that it got a great lot of attention in Africa. I'm sure that's the case. I just always think that... You've got to read more African that, media. And I, that's just, <laughs> no doubt about that. But, you know, you've got to elevate this issue. If you're going to elevate the cause of African America, you've got to do it more than this, and more than this president has done yeah. in his first term. All right, up next. How much is Donald Trump actually, really, factually worth? We did the math, or at least Bloomberg's Caleb Melby did the math. We'll interrogate that guy after these words. So Mr. Donald Trump says he's worth more than $10 billion. Our guest tonight has a slightly different take on those facts. Our Bloomberg business reporter colleague, Caleb Melby, joins us. You took the escalator here, right? Uh, yes, sir. Trump style. <laughs> Just like Mr. Trump takes the escalator. All right, so Trump says around 10. Mm -hmm. uh, you say how much and why the numbers differ. All right, so we we come to 2.9 uh, billion, and a billion, billion, still yeah. billion, still with a B. Lot of money yeah. that that Trump has. Uh, two big differences between our valuations. He gives himself, uh, in at least one estimation of his own net worth, 3.3 uh, billion for his brand, branded developments, and licensing deals. We don't treat that as its own line item. Uh, 
Uh, the other big thing is golf courses. He values those at two billion. We get about uh, a little less than six hundred million. All right, so those. let's just take the second one: valuing a golf course. It doesn't really have a value unless you sell it. I, right? I, I, absolutely. A lot of people, you know, will buy golf courses not to make money, but as as. But how did you assets. appraise the value of the courses as compared to how he appraises? So something we had that nobody else has ever had before when doing uh, this task is uh, he disclosed revenue figures for each of those courses in his FEC disclosure to the government. Right. So uh, we still don't know the exact cost structure of those, but we know on a revenue basis as compared to courses owned by publicly traded firms. Uh, but is that the only thing that determines the value of a course? Couldn't you? You argue that a course branded with the Trump name, even with the same revenue as another course, could be worth more if you sold it. Absolutely, and we do. So we talked to we talked to experts who said there is a real Trump brand premium for golf. His name means a lot. Those courses are very well manicured. They're really fun to play, really well designed. So when we looked at identifying what comparable courses would be good to analyze his against, we we picked the best ones and the most generous multiples available up there. There's nothing as good as the Trump name, but whatever, John. Well, I want to stay I want to stay with the name thing just because it seems to me that the biggest disparity between uh, how Trump values himself and how most of the rest of the world or people who look at this seriously do is on the question of brand valuation. Right? Absolutely. And the, and the name itself. I, I don't think anybody thinks that you can do this in a precise way, right? And I also don't think anybody thinks that brands are worth nothing, right? Sure. So how, without getting too green eye shady about it, how do you evaluate the, the, the value of a brand? Right. So, so again, another benefit we had was the FEC disclosure. We get to see all of these companies, many of which are essentially bank accounts for accepting these licensing revenue and royalty revenue for all these different books and branding deals for buildings around the world. And we can get an idea of the cash flow that's coming in specifically from those deals, uh, given the minimums and maximums, 32 to 55 million just from those alone. So when he says his brand is worth many billions of dollars and you guys come in at a much lower number, is he just making that up? Well, we don't know what his methodology is to come up with that. Um, I, certainly, it, it would probably have to include more than just those royalty and licensing he revenues. Used, I'm told by one source he uses an American-made abacus. <laughs> <laughs> just one source. Though. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, so, but, yeah, it's generally understood by him that uh, his name means you can sell condos at higher prices, right. you can sell hotel rooms at higher prices. Seems to be true. Yeah, yeah, people around the world believe that. They pay him to put his name on things he didn't develop, he didn't build, he doesn't own. So, in the context of the presidential race, in the end, there's a voyeuristic interest in whether it's 3, 4, 5, or 11. But what matters is how liquid he is, right, if he's going to spend money on ads. So, you all have a sense of how liquid he is, but what's the range there? And again, what accounts for the discrepancy? So um, the range uh, in his disclosures in terms of his cash, po cash position was at a minimum about $70 million, um, at the maximum about $300 million. And uh, that's what we give him because he has said many times uh, in the press that he has that much liquid. What of his non-liquid assets could he convert over pretty easily? Well, that, that's the nice thing about all, he, all his marquee properties is they, they aren't too levered. So he has all of these big buildings that if ever he needed to take a mortgage out, I mean, he has the ability. And, and if you look at his, his wealth as you estimate it, and then you look at his liquidity, how does he compare to most billionaires? Um, I, I mean, you would tend to want, you know, about 10% liquid, and that's a, just right about what he has, yeah. Uh, how, just let me I'll take, a, ask, take a viewers behind the scenes a little bit on this. How yeah. cooperative was Donald Trump in terms of you reporting this story? So when we first reached out to um, uh, Trump and his people, uh, they, they, they invited us over, and we had initial conversations. Once we started talking uh, about, um, you know, our numbers as opposed to, like, the ones, say, they released uh, in conjunction with the announcement of his presidency, um, uh, the conversation stopped. Stopped. We, just, just, just cut you, just cut you off. I, 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 we, I, we, um, we had an initial story on June sixteenth, um, uh, and um, we didn't have comment from them on that beyond the conversation. Is, we is had there with them on before the communication stopped? Was there something they pointed out where you had a spirited dispute with them? They said X is true, and you said actually X is not true. Well, um, it, it was always a debate about that top line number. We never got to have conversations about occupancy rates, cap rates, operating income margins, or anything like that on the record that would help us evaluate their numbers beyond uh, 
3.3 billion for right. a brand. For he just sold an apartment here for like 22 billion. Although his 21. daughter, his daughter was quoted as saying that wasn't about getting more liquid for the presidential campaign. Does he have a lot of assets like that that he could sell if he so, wanted? So at that building in particular, 502 Park Avenue, he has. Um, I want to say more than 20 unsold condo units that you know could be deployed to in to that price range. Uh, so uh, not all of them. That was a full floor yeah. unit. Some are smaller, but we value those collectively at 200 million. You might want to think about buying one of those. They'll give you a, probably give yeah. you a deal on it. <laughs> Caleb Melby has his own American-made abacus. Thanks for coming, chatting with us about Trump money. When we come back, millennials, millennials, everywhere you look, millennials. After this word from our sponsors. I want to speak to the millennials. 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 Millennials don't know what they're talking about. Welcome back. We're joined now by Kristen Soltis Anderson. She's an actual real life millennial and a pollster. She's a Republican and she's written a new book. It's called The Selfie Vote, where millennials are leading America and how Republicans can keep up. Kristen, thanks for coming Thank in. Thank you for having me. What are the misconceptions you think that millennials have in general about Republicans? So millennials tend to, when you talk to them in focus group settings, they'll say, look, I think Republicans are kind of of the past. They're old fashioned. They're not up to the times. They're not as tech savvy. They maybe aren't as good on things like race and diversity. They're not as socially progressive. Um, so you know, they don't view Republicans as being in tune with where their generation is at. Is that totally a misconception, or the book argues to some extent there's some truth to something? So uh, I try to argue that Republicans have not done themselves any favors. Republicans love to make kind of the same arguments that we've been making, whether it's on economics or cultural issues, that we've been making for the last few decades. And many of them kind of fall flat with this new generation that gets information in a different way, that trusts different sources, um, and that just kind of has a, has a different value set. Um, so I think that Republicans don't necessarily need to change everything that they believe in, but they need to start figuring out how how their policy ideas and overall principles can be applied to 21st century problems so, that millennials are so facing. So give me a concrete example of that. Uber, for instance, where you've had the private sector come in and kind of solve a problem where public sector, you know, public transportation systems in cities weren't weren't working so well. Um, here, this is the market solving a problem, providing better services, and doing it with efficiency and a level of service that you're just not getting from the government. Right. Republicans right. should talk about this as the sort of success story. All right, so let's uh, tick off our favorite do's and don'ts on how Republicans should reach out to millennials. Let's start with the do's. Uh, so do make sure that you are trying to reach them where they're at. Um, a lot of Republicans focus on big broadcast TV buys. That's what eats up most of your campaign budget, surely. Um, but young people aren't watching, you know, the network nightly news anymore. They're getting their news from digital sources, social media, sharing with friends. Make sure that you're making that a priority. That you're reaching them where they are. Give me a don't. Um, don't just talk about shrinking government. I've been in focus groups where I've talked about the concept of big government, and pe young people don't know what big government means as a term. Right. We in politics know that it's a shorthand for shrinking bureaucracy, but shrinking government isn't an end in and of itself that a lot of young people are excited big, about. So big government could be a band name. It <laughs> um, all right, so I'm going I'm to read you a list of things, and you tell me, like, in one sentence, Where's the opening for the Republicans in that area to okay. reach millennials? All right. Candy Crush. There are advertising opportunities within these games. You've got people's attention. You've got a captive audience. You may as well use it. All right. Education. Don't just focus on debt management policy. Focus on disrupting the status quo of what higher education looks like. Let people get skills in any way they can. Republican opportunity to reach millennials with Snapchat. <laughs> Be authentic. Be funny. Show them that you're not the monster that they some that the media sometimes portrays Republicans to be. All right, justice reform. Use this as an opportunity to show that you understand that we have not yet achieved racial equality in America and we need to do more to make sure we're allowing equality to occur. All right. Where is there an opportunity on marriage equity? To say, you know what, the Supreme Court has ruled and that's now the law, so let's take a look at how we can be respectful of others um, and not have this become the political hot button that it's always been. So a lot of Republican voters and conservatives care about foreign policy in the context of the next election. Is that an opportunity for Republicans to reach millennials? I think it is. And I intentionally try to shy away from making too many strong pronouncements about foreign policy in the polls because it can change in the blink of an eye if something goes wrong in Iran, et cetera, et cetera. But I think you 
you have the older millennials who are more hesitant about robust American engagement overseas. They remember the Iraq war a little bit more. They're more hesitant on that front. The younger millennials, they're coming of age in an era of ISIS, where they're, they're really feeling sort of threatened and under siege. And the polling suggests they're more in favor of a robust, bigger military um, and more foreign engagement. All right, the book is called The Selfie Vote, where millennials are leading America and how Republicans can keep up. Kristen Saltis Anderson, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Books available now at your finer bookstores. We'll be right back. Sure, hot out there, and it sure looks like the heat is getting to some of the presidential candidates who are doing some pretty, pretty weird things to get noticed. Take a look. How do you walk in those shoes? He's a war hero because he was captured. I like people that weren't captured, okay? I hate to tell you. He's so naive, he would trust the Iranians, and he would take the Israelis and basically march them to the door of the oven. He gave me his number, and I found the card. It, I wrote the number down. I don't know if it's the right number. Let's try it. 202. And always twirling, twirling for freedom. A lot of kooky stuff going on out there. Got three what? three theories. It's <laughs> hot. Why? A, it's hot. B, there's a lot of copy copycatism going on. Yeah. And three, yeah. like with so much else in American life, Mr. Trump sets the pace. Well, it's true. I also I'm looking at that at that at the the, the polls right now, and you got you know Trump, Bush, Walker, Rubio, Huckabee, Carson, Cruz, Paul, probably going to make the debate. But then you go to the to the bubble. You got Christie, Kasich, Perry, Santorum, Jindal, Fiorina. Some of those guys, and then Graham. Some of those guys, it seems to me, might be trying to get a little bit of national attention to try to do something to goose those numbers so they can get on the debate stage. It you seems know, to me there possible. Been, much has been made of John, the notion of John Kasich not getting on the, the first debate right. in his home state of Ohio. His New Hampshire numbers, benefiting from yeah. paid media, have moved up. It'll be fascinating to see in the national polls whether he moves enough to, have a, enough to have a chance here. He's now, for the first time, in that average, the RCP average, for whatever that's worth, right now, he's right now at 10. So, you know, Perry's now slipped a little bit below. Uh, Kasich, if he keeps bumping up, if he keeps riding this little momentum, he could make it. I also wonder, in the debate itself, whether people will go wacky, or I suspect a lot of the candidates will be told by their advisors and will execute the notion of serious and somber, ignore right. the carnival. Well, but do you not think there's going to be anybody who tries to take the big swing at Trump, who tries to get the moment of they'll strength? All, they'll all be poised, as if Trump goes after them, they'll all be poised, probably with one-liners. You know, Donald, is that what you said when you were giving money to Hillary With Clinton? anger or humor? Uh, sadness and anger. All right. Sanders advisor Tad Devine joins us tomorrow. He's good. You'll want to see that. Remember, this show is on twice a day at 5 and at 8. Until tomorrow, when we're joined by Tad Devine. Thanks for watching. Sayonara.